Hello and welcome back to the channel, it's Mark from PowerSonic and Apprentice One to One. Today we're going to have a look at some continuity testing and that's going to involve measurements of our little r1, little r2, little rn and then our big r1, big r2 and big rn and there's some subtle differences in the way we measure those things. We're inside the bay here at Apprentice One to One and we're going to have a look at some continuity testing on this socket circuit. Now this is a radial circuit and it's a different approach if you were to be testing a ring final. I covered that earlier on on the channel before, so if you want, you can dig back through and find that, and I'll try and link to it in the description as well. You can see here, I've put a big note on the board that says parallel paths, and as you'll note, these sockets are metal clad in metal conduit, and that conduit terminates into the distribution board behind me here itself. So you are never going to be able to remove all of the earth parallel paths um, within an installation when metallic containment is typically in use. It is very, very difficult, so you need to be aware as the person carrying out the test how that can impact on your results. So we'll start off by explaining why we use a capital letter and a non-capital to identify some of the different measurements we are taking. If we start with a little R1, little R2 and little Rn, in essence they are end-to-end -end resistances of a length of cable. Now that cable can run through a socket circuit or a lighting circuit or even just be a piece of cable laid across the floor. It is basically the measurement of resistance through it. So you would put a crocodile clip onto one end, one on the other and take a value of resistance along it. And with the little R1, that is your line conductor, the little R2, that is your CPC, and the little Rn is the neutral conductor. Now if that was three phase, you would obviously have the three line conductors to be taking those measurements through as well. Now when you're doing your ring final circuits especially, they are really important measurements to take because they can help build a picture of continuity through those conductors as you step along through the test sequence. But with this one on a radial circuit, in essence, we've got the socket just down there, which is end of line. So we know that's the final point. And then the origin is here in this distribution board behind me. So we can take a measurement between those two points and see what value of resistance we get. Now, sometimes on larger complex installations that aren't close together in a room as we have here, that's a very difficult test to carry out. You may need multiple wander leads to get from one end of a cable to another and zeroing all of that off becomes unrealistic, especially if you're traveling between floors of a building. It's just not a practical way of carrying out testing. So we have these big R1, big R2 and big RN, so the capital denominations. And that's a way for us to use the cabling within an installation to gather values of resistance through them. So with the R1 plus R2, in essence, as we're going to demonstrate behind in the consumer unit here, you make a connection between your line and your CPC. So you join them together. And then at the end of line, so at the end of the circuit, you put your test meter in and measure for resistance between those two points. So we'll take a measurement between line and CPC at that final socket, and it will give us a value of resistance around that loop of cable. So we are basically measuring the end-to-end -end resistance of the line and the CPC together. And the same applies if you do the R1 and Rn. So that's the line and the neutral. You form a loop and you get that resistance value. So if you'll excuse my very bad drawing, you can see here, this is the consumer unit. We take our line and CPC cables around this radial socket circuit. I've left out the neutral so we can easily understand what's going on. And you can see we've put a little link in here between the line and the CPC. So when we take our measurement, these are the test probes going into the socket with our little test set there. You will get a value of resistance that measures all the way through this CPC, back down and up through the line and gives you a value of resistance through those cables. Now obviously when we're doing um, twin and CPC, flat twin and CPC cable, we know that the CPC is a smaller conductor and based on the differences in those, you can use a calculation to give you a rough idea of what the value of resistance is between the CPC and between the line as well, without measuring it end to end. So we'll go and get this safely locked off down at the board that feeds this particular area of Apprentice One to One, and then we can open the consumer unit behind me and take a look inside.
Okay, so now we've gone through the process of locking off at the distribution board feeding down to here. I can take the cover off, run through the safe isolation process, and then we can start our continuity testing. Okay, so I've been through the safe isolation process, and again, if you want to see how that's done, I've shared videos on the channel before of that already. This does also have solar PV installed on it. Now, obviously, it's an indoor roof. It doesn't really generate much energy, but there's a battery system that can backfeed through this into the wider installation. So it's important to make sure you've gone through the safe isolation procedure with the inverter and battery storage system as well, as I have done here. So we can get in a bit closer now and have a look inside this Proteus twin stack consumer unit using the TIS MFT Pro Plus and we'll run through some of those continuity tests we've just been speaking about. So excuse the torchlight that we're working via at the minute, but as I've explained, we've knocked the power off down here already. You can see we're speaking about with the steel containment coming into the top of this consumer unit here. So that is pushed and coupled into the enclosure itself. It's all left down. At every single socket within this circuit, there is earth connections between the back box and the socket fronts. And again, those metal connections between those back boxes onto the conduit. So if you want to take an end-to-end -end measurement of the CPCs running through this conduit, or if it was metal trunking, it is really very difficult. Because if you take your CPC out of the earth bar, you go to the end of line and disconnect the CPC, and you take a measurement of resistance between those points, all the way along through that circuit, it then crosses over into the socket front, onto the conduit, back through the conduit onto another socket, where it then makes another connection and it can really impact the measurements of resistance that you were taking. And equally, if you do your end-to-end -end resistance measurements, so our big R1 and big R2, if we join the CPC together with that line conductor inside this consumer unit and then go off to the end of line, we'll be measuring the value of resistance that's there through that cable, but also with those parallel paths on the conduit joined in to every socket along the way. So as an inspector, when you're doing an EICR or uh, an initial verification on a new installation that's got metallic containment in place, you need to understand that it can impact on the values you may be measuring. This is a perfect example where the R1, R2 link lead from Superrod can come into its own. As I've shared before on my social media output, if you are measuring your R1, R2 values with a link out cable within a consumer unit or distribution board, it is really important to disconnect the CPC from the terminal bar when you make that connection onto the line. And that's to give yourself the best possible prospect of not having any parallel paths at play. However, when you've got an installation like this in front of you and there's lots of metallic um, containment within an installation, you're never going to avoid that anyway. So there's no real need to disconnect the CPC from that uh, terminal bar. You can just use the clip and the magnet in its intended application as per its design and carry out that test. And I'll show you how you can make that connection on this board behind me here. So you can see we've got our RCBO here that's looking after the sockets within this space. There is two lines and neutrals going into it, but that is because we have another socket just tapped straight off the bottom of this distribution board that is wired straight into the RCBO and the other longer leg of this radial circuit runs off to the end of this room. So we've essentially created a branch point from the RCBO. So we can clip onto our earth terminal bar with the R1, R2 link lead and then join in with the magnetic tip onto the line within this consumer unit. And now we can take the TIS MFT Pro Plus with the appropriate leads and go to the end point and get a measurement of our big R1 and big R2. So as we go into the continuity option, you can see it's asking for our probes to be connected into the positive and the negative ends of this particular arrangement and we need to remember that we're using our CPC and our line on this socket adapter so you don't just match the colours up you have to think about what you're actually measuring with this plug top when it's connected into the end of that circuit and we also need to zero our lead so I'll just do that right now. So also from Superrod is this little holder for your socket adapter tester but it does double up as a zero in um, connector for your plug top leads. So I can pop that onto the end of here. If we press the zero in option, the test set should start to run through its little process of taking measurements of resistance and then zero off this lead to discount it from any of the measurements that we take 
um, at the end of this circuit and you can see now that's gone to green to show we are actually zeroed. So let's go off to end of line and see what measurement of big R1 and big R2 we get. You can see we're in to the plug top, important to get the switch on rather than off, easy mistake to make that I do very often. And then we've got the test instrument down here, so the TIS MFT Pro Plus. We're into the right probes on the top and we can hit test and it should give us a measurement pretty quickly. You can see it's running through its thing now and we've got a value of 0 0.26 ohms through this radial circuit down to this socket point. And just to give you an overview of how this runs, it's running up in this conduit here, along, down into this socket uh, spare down here, back up and across, down into another socket, up and across, down into another socket, up and across and back into the distribution port. So whilst it's quite a short um, room in terms of its run around the top, there is a few drops here and there. So we have got a bit of length of cable, I believe it's four mil. So we'll see how that plays out based on an approximate measurement of this circuit. So we're gonna do the big R1 and big RN and I'll speak about why we're doing that later on. But you can see I've got the lead in with the switch on again and we've got the neutral leg this time going into our opposing terminal to the line. And if we hit test, we should get a value of impedance between the line and neutral along that circuit. And you can see it's come out at 0 0.3 ohms. Okay, so you can see up there, I've got the values of the big R1 and R2 and big R1 and big RN and 0 0.26 and 0 0.30. There's a small difference there. It's interesting to take those measurements and observe it. Primarily will be due to those parallel paths we spoke about through the containment. There could also be some slight differences in the termination lengths at each accessory point in the consumer unit. Although really that's negligible based on how I know these cables are installed. And there could be some subtle differences in the contact pins on the socket front as well. So there's no fine science to this. But that explains a little bit of what that difference might be and it is most likely due to those parallel paths. So you'll see I've given an approximate circuit distance of 30 meters. Now that's taking into account following the line conductor from the consumer unit to the end point of this circuit going up and down each leg of the conduit as we move round. So that can seem like quite a long estimation but when you look at the number of tubes around this circuit and the fact the line conductor drops all the way down it then runs all the way back up it before moving along up and down it soon adds up so i've made an estimation at 30 meters and there is some calculations we can use to obtain um, a value of length from the tables within the on-site guide and in this case guidance note three so this is table b1 and it's on page 182 and there's a couple of values from it we're going to need to take so if i come in closer and hopefully it'll focus you can see the 4 mil cable here, so 4 mil on its own, we've got 4.61, and 4 mil with 4 mil again is 9.22. So I'll explain why we need those two numbers. So the, the 4.61 is in essence if we were to take a value of resistance from one end of a cable to another. So if we was at a consumer unit here measuring through the line, and we took a wander lead out to measure at the other end, that's the number you would use in the calculation. But because we have got the line and CPCs of the same dimension, same CSA, running through this circuit, we use this 9.22 number, which as you can see, is double the value of the other one. So there's no real super clever maths going on in there. It is as basic as that. You've just got double the number of conductors running through that circuit. So in this case, when we're gonna work out the value of resistance based on my approximate length, you can see we would use the value of 9.22 times the 30 meters and divide it by 1000. And if we want to work out the length from our measured values here, we would use our R1, R2 of 0 0.26 times it by 1000 and then divide it by this 9.22 and it should give us our circuit length. So I'll punch those numbers in the calculators now and we'll see how they come out in the maths. Okay, so looking at the maths, you can see if we're working out the resistance based on the approximation of length that I've taken, it's coming out at 0 0.27 ohms. And that kind of compares in with the measured values we've taken doing the testing. I've popped in red here another value of 0 0.27. So with this, I uh, based that on the 9.22 figure for this top 0.27. But with the red one, I've used the 4.61. But obviously the length doubles when you're measuring that end-to-end. -end. So if we was counting that as one cable where we've made the connection in the consumer unit, 
gone to that end of line to take our measurement, the circuit length has doubled from 30 to 60 because it's running all the way through that line conductor and then all the way back through the CPC, creating this artificial single circuit. So you need to double the length and it comes out at the same value just to show you how those maths play along together. And then with the length, when we're using our measured value of R1, R2, if we times that by 1000 and divide it by this 9.22 figure, it comes out at a distance of 28.2 meters, which is pretty close to my estimate. So I made a good guess of how long these tubes are and the cables running through them. And then again, if we use the calculation of R1, R2, which is 0 0.26, and we take the times of that by 1000 and divide it by, in this case, 4.61, it's coming out with a length of 56.4 meters. And the reason you don't double your value of R1, R2 in there as we did with the length is obviously that's the measured value of resistance between that artificial loop of cables. So the line all the way back through the conduit, returning through the CPC and you make your measurement, that is a fixed value of resistance for that cable. You times it by 1000 and then divide it by the value from the table. So in this case, if it was a single four mil cable rather than those two separate ones, a 4.61, you've got a length of 56.4 meters, which is basically double the length, which is why we doubled it up there in that calculation. So I hope that makes sense. The tables are in the on-site guide and also in guidance note three. As I said, it's page 182, it spills over to the next page as well for the larger size conductors. And you can just play around with the maths and double check the values of resistance that you're measuring, play out alongside what the calculations show they should be. So if you've got a design and drawing as well, that's going to be really helpful for you because on larger, more complex installations, it's very difficult to go around and see and approximate the length of a circuit. If you've got that document there that shows the cable routes with their lengths, you're going to be able to make a firmer guess at what that is to compare to your measured test values and see how some of those parallel paths might be affecting your R1, R2 measurements. So I hope that's made sense. If you've got any questions in and around this video and doing continuity testing of your R1, R2s and the differences between the little and big letters within those calculations, please do drop them in the comments below. If you want to ask any other questions around testing or see some other videos of certain bits of testing, please do let me know and I'll try and put them together on the channel here. And otherwise, thank you for watching and I'll see you on the next one.